Today we're gonna to go over the history of aluminum from discovery to widespread adoption. Now aluminum is great because it doesn't rust, corrode, it's relatively strong, it's lightweight, and it is relatively inexpensive to produce, at least now, we'll get into that later. And it's the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust, but it's not easily extracted, which is why it took so long for it to become widely used. But it's actually a really interesting story, so stick around and you can see how they discovered it, all the trials and tribulations, and how it ends up as car frames and pergolas today. Here's the great tale of aluminum, from humble residue to building material. So aluminum in various forms dates back all the way to the 5th century BC or BCE, whichever you prefer. Back then, it wasn't used as the kind of aluminum you see now. It was kind of a residue that they would use in dyes to make the dye bond to the fabric or whatever they were dyeing. Now, the use of aluminum as a metal was actually pretty tricky, and it was many, many, many years later. So we're gonna go from the 5th century BC all the way to the mid 1700s. So there's this cool, mysterious crystal that scientists were studying. They're trying to figure out what it is, what it does, how to make it, that kind of stuff. And it was discovered that this crystalline substance, kind of looking like salt, called alumina had metallic properties. And this sparked kind of a gold rush, but we'll call it an alumina rush. And the scientists of the day were doing all sorts of experiments trying to figure out the chemical properties of this new thing that they had realized was a metal. And there were, like anything, a lot of failures. And it wasn't until the early 1800s that they got the chemical formula right. Well, kind of. Now they got the chemical formula right, so what are you gonna do with that? They wanted to get the metal out of it. And in the early 1800s, they got kind of close. And the reason why is electricity became a really, really big help. But part of the problem was they'd come out with a material that contained potassium and sodium and no way to get the metal itself out of it. And there's this British chemist named Humphrey Davy, who was one of the first to get really, really close. So he extracted the metal, but it was bonded with iron in an alloy and he couldn't separate the aluminum from the iron. Now, just because he couldn't get the iron out doesn't mean he's not gonna take credit. So in 1808, he named that substance aluminum. And that was really hard to say, so then he settled on aluminum four years later. Humphrey Davy was riding high. And then in 1824, Hans Christian Ersted, a Danish physicist, figured out a complicated way to react aluminum with potassium. And that yielded a lump of metal that looked similar to tin. So we're getting close. And in 1826, he wrote, Aluminum has a metallic luster and somewhat grayish color and breaks down water very slowly. And he didn't know it, but he was onto something huge. Right on the edge of massive discovery, he just stopped. I guess he just lost interest in aluminum. And what's really ridiculous is he didn't notify anybody else that he figured out the things he did with potassium. He just did it and kind of called it a day. And Humphrey Davy is all the way in Great Britain doing stuff with iron, and these two could have probably come together and figured something out, but they didn't. In 1827, German chemist Friedrich Wohler got in touch with Ersted and continued his research. So it's unclear why Ersted just stopped. Maybe he was bored, maybe he was sick of it, doesn't matter. But Wohler took over that research. And he realized that Ersted kind of made some big mistakes. And that lump of aluminum that he was so excited about was actually just a big lump of potassium with a little bit of aluminum in it. And years later, Wohler figured out a way to do it with less potassium, and that yielded not quite aluminum, but a much more pure substance. And this marked the very early production of aluminum products. Just for clarification, it's 18, roughly 1830 right now, so it's been almost 130 years that people have been looking at this, and we are just getting to producing actual products. Now, Wohler's method did not actually result in a lot of aluminum. And since it was so intensive to make such a small amount, that meant that aluminum was extremely expensive and extremely rare. At the time, it was even more rare and more valuable than gold. And more on that in a moment, we'll, we'll get to that piece. Now we're gonna jump ahead 20 years to France, where a French chemist named Henri Etienne St. Clair de Ville developed a method of industrial aluminum production that was faster, cheaper, and made industrial production much more feasible and it involved replacing potassium with a much cheaper sodium. Now, Henry's research, he wasn't a lone scientist just working in a lab. It was backed heavily by the French government and Napoleon III. And when I say backed heavily, I mean he got like 20 times the average income of a family at the time to do this research. Now, why was Napoleon III so interested in aluminum? Well, for weapons, of course. He was interested in creating aluminum weapons that would allow the French military to be much more effective and carry lighter loads. And before all this research was public, think like DARPA, this is the, the level of secrecy, Napoleon III held a banquet where all of the most honored guests were given aluminum utensils and the least honored guests were given gold. 
those suckers. And then in 1855, they decided to go public. 12 small ingots of aluminum were displayed at the Paris Exposition. Now, this fair was for Napoleon III and the French to really flex their muscles and show how advanced they were. And they called this aluminum the silver from clay. And everybody was stunned. They were freaked out and thought it was the greatest thing they'd ever seen. And like any hysteria, people thought they could use it for anything. They thought they'd use it for arts, music, medicine, utensils, a host of other things. And this popularity led to aluminum slowly being introduced to the market. And heavy emphasis on slowly because it was still really expensive to produce. And metal manufacturers whose whole business was iron and bronze were really reluctant to switch over to something that was untested and super expensive. And seeing that nobody else would do it and I kind of have some knowledge about this, they decided to do it themselves. So DeVille and some partners decided to create the first industrial aluminum smelting operation. And that was in 1856. And for those of you who don't know, smelting is a process by which a metal is obtained, either as the element or as a simple compound, from its ore. And this is done by heating it beyond the melting point, ordinarily in the presence of oxidizing agents, such as air or reducing agents, such as coke. Now, this industrial operation started off with synthesis of pure alumina, which was that salty substance we talked about before. And in 1858, DeVille was introduced to bauxite, and then soon developed what would be known as the DeVille process, which employed bauxite as the source for alumina production rather than synthesis. And in 1860, alumina production really started picking up, notably starting with British ironmaster Isaac Lothian Bell, who opened a factory for producing aluminum in 1860. And at the opening of the factory, always the showman, it was noted that he waved to the crowd with an aluminum top hat, which at the time had to be outrageously expensive. Think of a top hat made of gold, more expensive. Now remember that fair in 1855? Well, they had another Paris Expo in 1867, and they had a lot more to show than just a few ingots. And on display were all sorts of different applications for aluminum, including wire, foil, and even a new alloy, which was aluminum mixed with bronze. Now, why did people love this aluminum bronze mixture? Well, one, it was cheap to make. Two, it was corrosion resistant, and it had really beneficial mechanical properties. Now, through the 1860s and 70s, aluminum production continued to grow as electricity became more available. And not only was electricity growing in availability, but so were the chemicals needed for producing the aluminum itself. Now, we still haven't hit our main stride where it's really out there. Factories were still really small, and production was not super plentiful. You still had a lot of waste. In 1886, we had two newcomers on the scene. French engineer Paul Harold and American engineer Charles Martin Hall. And they figured out a super efficient way to make aluminum involving molten cryolite. Now, a big part of the trouble with producing aluminum is that the melting point for alumina, so you can smelt it, is really, really high. And using molten cryolite, you actually reduced the melting point of the alumina. And even today, this is still the most common and efficient way to get aluminum from alumina. And it is known as the hall herald process. So next time you're anywhere there's aluminum, you can show off to your friends. You know about the hall herald process. And now that we had a much easier and efficient way to smelt aluminum, an Austrian chemist named Carl Joseph Baer found a way to extract alumina from bauxite in a much more efficient manner. This is known as the Baer process, and obviously people like naming processes after themselves. And it replaced the DeVille process that we mentioned earlier. Sorry, DeVille. And the Baer process is still used today. And with all these increased efficiencies, it allowed for the price of aluminum production to decline, which allowed for large-scale industrial production and application. And by the early 1890s, aluminum was used in all sorts of different applications, including eyeglass frames, jewelry, optical instruments, and many other everyday items. And in the early 20th century, aluminum began to replace copper and cast iron in cookware for obvious reasons. It doesn't corrode, and you don't need to worry about it rusting like you would with copper or cast iron. And through the turn of the century, processes continue to be refined and tweaked to make the price of aluminum that much lower and its applications that much broader. And around this time, since there were so many applications, aluminum alloys became much, much more popular. Now, why would you go to an alloy when you have regular aluminum? Well, because an alloy is gonna be much, much stronger than pure aluminum. So you can keep the corrosion resistance, lightweight nature, and relative affordability of production while actually increasing the strength so you can use it for more applications. And in the early 20th century, aluminum began to replace heavier metals in things like train cars, airplanes, building materials, all sorts of things. And since aluminum demand and production picked up, the price dropped even more. We were just cranking out aluminum like nobody's business. So around this time, everybody's trying to get the same bauxite. And that's when they started looking at aluminum recycling. And aluminum recycling is really cool. You can actually endlessly recycle aluminum and reuse it. So it is an incredibly useful substance in that way. Post-consumer recycling began in the 1940s. 
And starting in 1945, aluminum consumption increased 10% a year, every year for 30 years. That is a lot of aluminum. And in the 1970s, aluminum consumption got another push with the aluminum cans that we know and love today and use in the food industry. And that push in demand made it an exchange commodity beginning in 1978. And since then, aluminum has been traded with US dollars and its prices fluctuated with the exchange rate. And today, aluminum is used everywhere. Even my truck frame is made out of aluminum because it's light, strong, and it increases fuel efficiency. You will see aluminum all over the place, including on the luxury pergola. Now that you know the history of aluminum, if you're interested in really cool louvered pergolas, check out theluxurypergola.com. And thanks for watching. Comment, subscribe, like, and let us know if you'd like us to do more educational type content like this.